Is this thing on? All right, I think it's on. Hello, how's it going? I'm Sam, and it is week seven of the spring 2023 term. And for the Gen Cam stream, we're going to be doing redox and electrochemistry, introduction two. And by the way, this is not actually a stream. I'm just recording this one in advance. That said, uh, all the other streams I put up, I had done a practice round first and then gone back and done them. Uh, this time, this sort of is the practice round. So hopefully, uh, it goes well and smoothly. And it's interesting and efficient and correct. So before we dive into any of this redox stuff, let's just clarify a few things. First off, oil rig. Of electrons. Oxidation is loss and reduction is gain of electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Just to keep the vocabulary straight, I think there are some other acronyms out there, but that's the one that I prefer. Um, so everything we're talking about when we're doing reduction and oxidation, or when you combine them into redox, uh, will fuel electrochemistry, and we're talking about electrons going from one thing to another. And the other thing to briefly cover before we get into this, let's say we have element Q, which is a fake element. This is an example. Element. Right now, the oxidation state of Q is zero. If the oxidation state goes up and it gets oxidized, then it could become plus one. Or we frequently would actually say one plus. So if the oxidation state goes up even more, it can become two plus. If it goes up even more, it would become three plus, etc. If the oxidation state of a Q3 plus went down, it would become 2 plus, etc. So this zone right up here, this number, tells us the oxidation state. It tells us the formal charge, which is related to the oxidation state. So oxidation is loss. So let's say that Q in its natural form, let's say that it's a new noble gas that I just invented. Quonium, or I'll come up with the name in a sec, maybe. Um, and somehow you cause one of, let me actually zoom in on this a little bit. Let's say that we somehow cause Q to lose one of its electrons. Electrons have negative charge. I mean, like, look, there's a negative sign right there. So when we just lost a negative, we got a plus. Let's say that somehow we could get rid of another of those electrons. That's when Q would have become 2 plus. And then if we get rid of another one, you see where this is going. So the thing is, sometimes those electrons will straight up leave Q. But sometimes the way that Q could lose electrons and be oxidized would be by sharing them with something else. <clears throat> so, for example, if uh, I shouldn't use Q again because I just said that Q had eight. So let's say we have another element. I'm trying to think of letters that don't have. I don't think there's a. Is there an element E out there? I don't know. Let's say uh, QR. That's definitely not an element. QR, different fake element. But let's say that this one likes, it's like nitrogen. That is QR in its oxidation state of zero. But let's say that, for example, an oxygen comes along right here and forms a bond with it. And another oxygen comes along and forms a bond with it. And another oxygen comes along and forms a bond with it. All of a sudden, this electron that Q used to own, and this one, and this one, now it has to share with oxygen. So all of those oxygens just gained an electron. They all got reduced. But all of those oxygens just caused the QR, fake molecule, to 
to lose electrons, therefore it lost negative charge. So its oxidation state went, <laughs> I was trying to point at it, but I was going to say up, and I just drew down arrow. Its oxidation state went up. The oxidation states of these oxygens went down. And the oxidation state of this QR, the central molecule, went up. So that is uh, some of the fundamental concepts of oxidation reduction. One other thing I just want to talk about is this is all sort of rooted, let me just scooch this over a little bit, right here in the electronegativity table. So carbon is a very common one that we're going to be looking at. When carbon is neutral on its own with an oxidation state of zero, uh, it looks like that. Now, of course, in nature, carbon prefers to have eight valence electrons, so it ends up forming bonds. Now, carbon has a higher, 2.55 is higher than 2.2, .2, higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So in the case of methane, when four hydrogens show up, each one's bringing an electron, and the carbon ends up bonding with all of them, and my drawing's horrible. So let me just quickly fix that. Effectively, since carbon has a 2.55 electronegativity, oops, and all these hydrogens have 2.2, .2, the electron density here stays mostly around carbon. Hydrogens get a little access, but it's as if carbon had gained four electrons. So it's as if, within this methane molecule, it's as if carbon gained four electrons, so it's got a four minus charge, because it just got four extra negative things. And each of these hydrogens, it's going to be as if it's a plus one charge. So I want to note, again, I'm bringing up this table because that was due to the fact that carbon has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen, right? Carbon has a much higher electronegativity, not much, but a significantly enough higher electronegativity than hydrogen that the carbon, it fundamentally gains the electrons. The carbon gets reduced. Whereas if carbon is sitting around here and some oxygen comes over, let's say, and the oxygen sees this carbon, and then they're like, let's pair up right there. There's a bond. And then there's this other lone pair over here that comes over. Sorry, not lone pair, lone electron that comes over and forms another bond. And then the carbon still has this and this going on, uh, which probably that would get bonded to something else like this, probably, honestly. Actually, let's look at that. I just drew a uh, formaldehyde, is what that's called. And let's see, oxygen, you can see right here. No, you can't, because I just <laughs> covered it up. Oxygen has the second highest electronegativity on the entire table. Only fluoride has higher. So oxygen will definitely be hogging the electron density there from carbon. So the two electrons that carbon sort of shared with oxygen, oxygen basically gets ownership of those. And by losing electrons, by losing negativity stuff, the carbon goes up to, in its oxidation state from sharing with the oxygen, the oxygen goes down to. Um, however, each of these hydrogens over here is, hydrogen is still less electronegative than carbon. So the carbon is able to at least take more of the electron density from those hydrogens. So that actually sort of cancels that out because the carbon gains those electrons from the hydrogens. So the carbon's actually in this formaldehyde here, back to zero, and the hydrogen is at a one plus, one plus. So there's some nuance to uh, reduction and oxidation when you're inside a molecule that has more than one atom, which we're gonna see very soon. So let's actually dive in here. Um, convenient to break up these reactions uh, into half reactions when we're combining reduction and oxidation. 
So these are half reactions. Uh, something else is going on here to enable this to happen, most likely. But let's check it out. Right here, we start out with chloride, which has an oxidation state of minus one. So that's going to be a chlorine. Uh, chlorine atom, that's totally neutral with an oxidation state of zero, would have seven electrons, of course. If it's minus one, it must have an extra electron. Whereas Cl2, that this becomes, there's a bond there, and then they each have full valence shells. And within this bond, there's essentially two electrons. And since chlorine and chlorine have identical electronegativities, they are going to share that bond equally. So they each have seven. And so the oxidation state of each chlorine, when there's two of them in Cl2, this one's zero. Let me do that in a different color. Maybe my oxidation state's in orange here. That's zero, that's zero, but this is a one minus. So its oxidation state went up. It lost an electron. Oil rig. Oxidation is lost. It lost an electron, and its oxidation state went up. So this was an oxidation. Again, it lost an electron, and its oxidation state went up. It went from 1 minus to 0. So that's up, right? Okay. Next one, we start out with the cation here, positive charge. It already lost electrons. However, here we come, and maybe it's going to lose more. Let me think about this for a sec. The manganese going into this has already lost electrons, and now oxygen is coming. I mean, you would think it's getting oxidized if it's forming a bond with oxygen because oxygen can steal even more of its electrons and i think that is exactly what's happening here so the manganese by the way has a d shell it's a two plus because it lost its four s shell manganese is uh the fifth one into the d block on the fourth row of the periodic table so it's got a three d shell with five electrons in it this is it in its two plus state again this does not follow the octet rule because it is too far down the periodic table right let's just go real quickly look this periodic table is showing us um oh here it is look manganese has a very low electronegativity it's fine being positive it's not trying to take your electrons and the reason it's two plus is because it lost the one that would go there, it lost the one that would go there. And then it has five of them evenly distributed through its D suborbitals, or I might have a vocab word, so I don't know. So back to here. So its oxidation state is two plus there, and when the oxygen comes in, this oxygen is going to be like, hey, share that with me. Why don't you? And this oxygen becomes one minus. And then another oxygen is going to come in and say, share that with me, why don't you? Um, in fact, the oxygen might even take two now that I think about it. Uh, I'm not sure actually if it would form a double bond or not. But either way, the manganese central atom will have just lost two electrons. So its oxidation state will have gone up even more. So this one's interesting, and it doesn't look like it right off, and there's a chance I'm incorrect as well. I hope not. But I believe this manganese is being oxidized here, even though there's not a formal charge on the polyatomic molecule. The manganese central atom itself has had an increase in oxidation and a loss of electrons. So this has been an oxidation as well. Okay, C, we have H2, right? And that 
is indicative of a bond containing two electrons. They're shared equally because hydrogen has an equal electronegativity to hydrogen. So if they, ah, oh, but this is interesting. This reaction is telling us that basically, however it worked out, when these things split up, one of the hydrogens got both of the electrons. So that's now a hydride, right? It's an H minus. And the other hydrogen got zero electrons. So it lost electrons. Its oxidation number went up. So that's an oxidation. Okay. So one last one. Let's make all this stuff smaller here. I'm kind of dubious of my answer for magnesium oxide still, but I'm going to roll with it for now and consider it. There is a version of thinking about this that's based on the fact that oxygen is super high electronegativity, where you could say that if you increase the number of bonds to oxygen, you're oxidizing something. So that's another perspective from which we're going to call it that. Um, and if I'm wrong, I apologize. If I'm wrong also, I hope somebody lets me know. So that's an oxidation. So is this. So is this. And uh, yeah, I did not do these. This is my first take on all these. So Again, I apologize if I'm wrong. So by the token of what I just said, this might be a reduction, but let's find out because we have N that is sharing with three oxygens, one of which has an extra electron on it. Something like that. And then there must be some like, hmm, these lone pairs must get involved in double bonds. There's got to be like a bunch of like double bondy resonance, something or another. But let's look at the nitrogen right here. So this nitrogen in its native state has five electrons. That's the neutral atom. And now it's sharing three electrons in these bonds with the oxygens. So the nitrogen that's in our nitrate ion right here is in a three plus oxidation state. The nitrogen on this side, NO, I'm pretty sure it's a double bond. And then you have a radical on it. Now this nitrogen, it gets, I think it is one to an oxidation state of zero, because it gets one from here, one from here, one from here, half of that, half of that. So now it's oxidation state is zero. So it went from three to zero. It decreased its bonds to oxygen. Its oxidation number again went down. So this is the reduction on our list. Um, again, this one I'm dubious of because typically, we're going to see that if you start out as an ion and become not an ion, that's usually a reduction. It's usually a reduction to pure form, not mixed with oxygen. So I'm going to leave it for now. And I apologize if I have misled any of you. Okay, so this next one, we are not actually doing question four. We're just doing question five. So let's point out a vocabulary thing. The oxidant gets reduced, right, while it oxidizes. And the reductant gets oxidized <clears throat> while it reduces. And another, reduces. another vocabulary word, you can call your oxidant the 
oxidizing agent. You could call your reductant the reducing agent. So keep in mind that in this case, we're talking about one molecule is giving an electron to another molecule. So whoever is giving the molecule is the reductant. Sorry, who's, whoever is giving the electron is the reductant. Whoever is taking the electron is the oxidant. But the oxidant gets reduced, right? So just keep that in mind that this, when we're talking about something being an agent, or an int, the thing that it does is the opposite of the thing that happens to it. So how about right here with tin2? It looks like it goes from having two fewer electrons than would make it electrically neutral to having four fewer electrons. Electrons are negative, so if you're Two plus, that means you're two fewer of negative things. If you're four plus, you're four fewer of negative things. This is an oxidation number that has gone up. Therefore, tin got oxidized because its oxidation number went up. It lost electrons. Oxidation is lost. Tin lost electrons. It got oxidized. So it must have been the reductant. It gave the electrons to, to this hydrogen peroxide right here. When it gave electrons to hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide got reduced, therefore hydrogen peroxide, sorry, yes, it got reduced, therefore tin got oxidized by hydrogen peroxide, and hydrogen peroxide was the oxidant. Let's note another thing here is when we're talking about an oxidant and reductant, we're talking about reactants too, right? It wouldn't make sense to answer that in terms of it being water or tin four. That would not make sense for this question because those are products. Those are on the right-hand side. Those are the end of the reaction. Oxidant and reductant pertain to the species that are going into the reaction, not coming out. So in this case, I'll be more specific, tin two was the reductant and peroxide was the oxidant. By the way, if you're like, wait a minute, that's not enough oxygens, what's up with that? That's correct, you are correct. For these to be uh, fully complete, we'd have to balance them, which was the question in number four. But that's just not what we're doing right now. We skipped that part for the moment because it can get a little complex sometimes. Um, I just wanted to note that. Okay, so for the next one, we have lead oxide, lead two oxide. Was that lead four oxide? Uh, I'm not sure. It's some sort of lead oxide in mercury. So here we have mercury zero. Mercury zero loses two electrons to become mercury too um yeah and again these aren't balanced so there'd have to be a lot of that but in doing so if mercury lost the electrons then it got oxidized which means it is the reductant it reduced it gave its electrons to the lead oxide which got reduced because it was the oxidant that oxidized mercury. Okay, and for our last one, let me get that out of the way. See what I'm saying though with that from previously. So with the last one on this, we have aluminum and uh, chromate, heptachromate. Maybe it's a uh, 
chromium seven dioxide. Di anyway, I don't actually know the name of that. I think there's a lot of permutations on how you can combine chromate and oxygen, but I'll tell you this for sure. Uh, chromate is a famous oxidizing agent. So almost certainly chromate's the oxidant. I just know that from organic chemistry that you'd use chromate type stuff if you really want to oxidize something strongly. And let's check this out with our aluminum. We start out with an oxidation state of zero. Its oxidation state goes up to three, meaning it lost three negatives. It lost three electrons. So aluminum got oxidized. So aluminum must have been the reductant. It's the thing that gave electrons, right? Reductant. It, aluminum gave electrons to this chromate. Then obviously the chromate and its oxygen did its own thing. But the aluminum gave electrons, and therefore it was the reductant. The chromate took them. It oxidized the other thing, so it was the oxidant. Okay. Cool, there's the concept with that. And like I said, balancing these gets tricky because we've got these O's and these H's that aren't adding up correctly. And that's where you start adding in waters and protons and hydroxides, depending on if you're in an acidic or basic solution. They stipulated in that question that if we were to balance it, we would do it uh, with just the acidic stuff. But uh, I think that's for next week. For this week, we're just, thinking about the concepts. So again, it's all about that oil rig. It's all about looking at the oxidation number and how that changed. And then just remembering that electrons are negative. Okay, let's uh, look at this next one. All right here. So did I skip something? No, 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 I think, I think that was correct. Yeah, okay. 12. So, assuming the schematics below represent galvanic cells, identify the half reaction occurring in each. Let's actually skip ahead really quick because this cell notation represents this kind of thing. This is basically a battery. Galvanic cell, battery, same diff. Um, this is, I was going to say quite similar to the battery in your car, but I think this is actually no, it's not. Where do I have one? The battery in your car has to do with, I mean, if you have a car. I'm not going to presume you have a car. And if you have an electric car, it might be different. However, the battery in your normal gasoline car, if that battery is the classic style, probably something more similar to that where we have different oxidation states of lead going on. I could be wrong. Sorry, that's a tangent. I shouldn't even speak to that because I lack confidence in the accuracy of what I just said. So here's the point. These cell diagrams represent cells like this, where we have an anode and a cathode. On the anode side, which is this, and it's really this thing right here. On the anode side, you can see you've got solid copper that's falling off into copper two plus ions. At, it's going from an oxidation state of zero to an oxidation state of two plus. It's losing electrons. This is where oxidation occurs in the anode. Oxidation occurs in the anode. And by the way, this electrochemistry stuff is yet another topic in chemistry that's pretty simple and also crazy complicated. Um, it's really easy to be confused by this, so definitely um, be gentle with yourself if you don't quite get this stuff as we go, or if you go in and out of understanding it. Um, it's a bit elusive. Check this out over here on the cathode side. We have silver ions that gain electrons and then join on to the solid silver. So at the cathode, reduction occurs. At the anode, oxidation occurs. And 
part of what makes batteries work and what gives you a flow of electrons is that the copper is acting as the reductant. The copper is sending electrons over to here. When those electrons leave the copper, copper nuclei fall off and become aqueous ions, cations. And those electrons travel over here and get to the cathode, and those extra electrons attract the aqueous silver ions that then glue on using those electrodes over there at the, sorry, those electrons over at the cathode. So let's note how this is written. We have the anode. The solid anode is on the left, right? That's this. Then we have the dissolved ions in the anode solution. Now, in there, they could have written it like and then it would be 2 molar NO3 minus. I think they could have written it like that, but I see how they did it this way. They put these two counter ions together into one salt and then told you it was dissolved. So I see the logic there. Let's note that they did bother to tell us the concentration, and we're not going to really play with that this week, but that will be an important part of determining how much energy we can get out of these cells. Like, just because you set up a cell with copper and silver um, doesn't mean it's going to behave the same way every time. It will also depend on the concentration of the ions that you have in your solution. Because really what we're playing with with these cells is particles transitioning from and to solid and aqueous. So from solid to aqueous on one side and from aqueous to solid on the other side. So we have the anode, we have the anode solution essentially. Then we have this double line right here. That's the salt bridge. And then we have, and we're going to talk about that in a different question. That's this thing, the salt bridge. And then the cathode solution, again, with the concentration noted. And then the cathode. And this anode side is the side of oxidation. This is the side of reduction. But remember that the oxidation is done uh, to the reductant. The copper is the reductant because it reduces the silver. The silver, is, or really the silver ions, are the oxidant because they oxidize the copper. Okay, so that's some background on these cells. So what's going on here? So we have in both cases, anode, anode solution, cathode solution, cathode. That's the way these diagrams work, with the salt bridge in the middle. So the anode is the oxidation. So the half reaction here for A, we have a, mag a solid magnesium. It gets oxidized, so it loses electrons. And look, it looks like it loses two electrons. It becomes two plus. So the oxidation half reaction, all of these are redox. They all have a reduction and an oxidation. The oxidation half reaction is that solid magnesium becomes aqueous magnesium two plus. And the reduction. Oh, and let's note, plus two electrons, right? Because when we put these together as redox reactions, those electrons get accounted for. But when we break them into half reactions, we might uh, be a lot clearer and more comprehensive by doing it this way. The reduction is when it's going to gain two electrons, right? So we actually... I'm doing this. I'm doing this up backwards. 
That's my bad. I should have started by saying that we actually have C2 plus as our starting aqueous plus the two electrons. There we go. And that's all going to come together in a reduction yielding solid copper. There we go. So for the second one, it's the same deal. The oxidation is that we had solid nickel and it's going to lose two electrons and therefore its charge goes up it becomes an aqueous ion and we have two electrons and then this is kind of interesting because if you were writing this out as a balanced chemical equation and we were paying attention to the nuclei look it looks like for every one nickel it's going to take two silvers because of that thing um, however, this is potentially annoying if you've <laughs> done a whole year of chemistry. We are not paying attention to the nuclei. We're paying attention to the electrons. So while that would be part of writing a correct balanced chemical equation, uh, it's not part of calculating cells. So I just want to note that. Um, I remember being a bit perplexed by that in the past. Perhaps I still am to some extent. But we have a silver and it's an ion and it's going to gain an electron and that's going to become solid silver so that's our reduction because it gained an electron so the thing is if we really wanted to balance that out then we would do two times that whole thing because then we have the two electrons balancing out right two electrons there two electrons there but that's not what we were asked to do we were just asked to write the half reactions the half cell reactions and that's what we did. We identified that these were written this way. The anode is where oxidation happens, the reductant, sorry, the cathode is where reduction happens. Oxidation. Okay, cool. Let's uh, keep rolling. So number 16 is next, which I apparently put over here. And it was noted to only do A and C. So maybe we'll do that. It will do more than that. I'm just going to clear up a little space here. Okay, so for the information provided, use cell notation to describe the following system. So once again, cell notation, we're just looking at it, so this should be pretty easy. Anode, solid anode, uh, aqueous, anode solution with concentrations. We're going to have X molar, then we're going to have something or another aqueous salt bridge, the aqueous part of the cathode, and then the solid cathode. So that's the model. Occasionally there are variations on that. Uh, specifically if you don't have a solid cathode, like if you're going from, I don't know, uh, what's an example? We're going from like iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus, maybe. If that was for whatever reason the cell we were doing, then we would need a separate cathode. And actually, that wouldn't be there because that'd be aqueous also. So that's the slight, um, it's not even really an exception, just a variation on the way this could go. But I don't think any of these cells are like that. So I just wanted to note that the way that I'm Doing this right now is pretty much how it always goes, but there are some exceptions. So this first one, in one half cell, a solution of platinum nitrate, and it forms platinum metal. So if we're forming platinum metal, then almost certainly that's the reduction. When you go from aqueous to solid, you've probably been reduced. Same deal over here, clearly. We have copper, solid, metal. It's got to be getting oxidized. Um, and it becomes copper 2 plus with nitrate. Now, I'm going to leave it as aqueous. The thing is... I feel like that's not really the best way to think about it because 
or sorry, it's not the best way to write it. I don't love writing aqueous things like this, because really, these aqueous things will be dissociated. So that platinum nitrate is actually going to be platinum 2 plus cations floating around in water with a bunch of, with twice as many nitrate anions floating around in water. Same deal over here. This is really going to be copper 2 plus cations floating around in water and two nitrate anions floating around in water. And how did I know that it would be platinum 2 plus and copper 2 plus? That's because nitrate is a common polyatomic ion that hopefully uh, you're developing a familiarity with. And you just are like, oh yeah, that's how it goes. So actually, let me not erase those, but just move these uh, a little bit small. Okay. Ah, no, no, hold still. I'm trying to do... Sorry, folks. There we go. That's what I was trying to do. Okay. So we had solid copper. This for A. And my cat just showed up. Diego, you want to say hi to people? He does in a sec. He's busy chewing his like inner elbow area. Okay, solid copper. This is the anode. This is where oxidation happens. And solid copper is going to fall apart into copper 2 plus. And all solute concentrations are one molar. We'll say, actually, I was about to write the one molar after the copper thing, but in that previous example, they had it in front. So I'll just do it the same way. So we're going to have one molar in copper 2 plus. And that is the cathode side and then here's the salt bridge and then we're gonna have one molar in platinum two plus I just want to double check should I be including that nitrate I don't want to but I just want to uh, I guess they they did include it so I'll include it I guess one molar so again i think it's very important to keep in mind that the copper and the nitrogen sorry the nitrate will have dissociated they're not bonded together it's just an ionic aqueous solution where they're negating the formal charges on their counter ion so that the total solution is neutral and then it's going on to platinum metal there we go so anode cathode what happens at the anode oxidation happens at the anode oxidation in this case is when the solid dissolves out into the aqueous and it sends electrons over here and these electrons are used to glue the aqueous. The electrons glue the aqueous platinum cations onto the solid platinum metal. Okay, Let's see. Let's see if I can do this one faster. Uh, we got one half cell. Got one half cell, silver electrode, and a silver nitrate solution, and then a copper electrode, copper nitrate. Uh, we can note that it's copper 2 plus, apparently. Whatever that's worth. Might be worth something. So we have silver electrode that becomes silver nitrate. Oh, in, it, in this one it says copper is oxidized. Did we get that over here? I don't think they said that in this. They didn't say that in that one. Oh, it forms the metal. So there we go. So they said it that way. So in this case, copper is oxidized. So once again, that means, and it was copper nitrate. Yeah, 
So copper is oxidized. Told us that we had one molar copper nitrate. Salt bridge nucleus is oxidized. It loses its electrons. It sends those electrons over to silver nitrate. Get a bunch of silver ions floating around in a counter ion aqueous relationship with this nitrate. It goes on to silver solid on the cathode. And oh, I think I actually just messed up one little detail. I did. Check it out. No outside line. So I apologize. I just noticed I just messed up this one little detail. You don't want that on the outside. No outside line on this. Otherwise, you're good. Okay. So even if you don't fully get what is being discussed here, this is a great case of the what is not so hard. The why might be confusing, but get the what straight and the why comes later. So oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. At the anode, the solid thing gets oxidized into ions. At the cathode, the ions get reduced into a solid thing. That's how these cells work. All right, so that was that question. And let's look at what, this is actually the last question. So that's cool, that's good. And the question is this, why is the salt bridge necessary in galvanic cells? Like the one in figure 17.3, which is this thing I just drew all over. Um, we also have another one that I got also from the textbook online. Same deal, a uh, galvanic cell that has the salt bridge. Sodium chloride salt bridge right there. Over here, we have a sodium nitrate salt bridge. So what is up with that? Why do we need the salt bridge? So anyone? Anyone? I'm kidding. Uh, there's no one here because this is pre-recording. I'm not live streaming. I um, mean, even if I were, that doesn't mean there would be anyone here. So the reason is basically this. Think about this. We start out with one molar. They're saying this is our initial concentration is one molar. There's that means since it's a NO32 for every one molar of the whole salt, when it dissociates, you end up with one of the coppers but two of the nitrates. But each copper has a positive two charge. Each nitrate has a minus one charge. So right when this starts, before any electrons have flowed, the solution, the liquid, aqueous solution at the anode side here is electrically neutral. And the same deal with the cathode side. However, once this circuit starts going and the reductant copper gets oxidized and sends its electrons over here and starts shedding itself into the solution as two plus copper cations, this is going to become more positive. And similarly, as the Ag plus ions over here silver cations join the solid silver, this is going to lose positive ions and this can become more negative. So you're going to end up developing a charge, a positive charge over here in your anode solution and a negative charge in your cathode solution if you didn't have the salt bridge. And the problem with that is these electrons, let's say, you know, we have a little, do this color. Here's a, an elect, whoa, that pen was way too big. Let me, I'll just go with green. 
we have an electron right here. And this electron was just on a copper with its other friend. And it was it's just starting to go. And its plan is it's going to go through over here. And by the way, this is where you would plug something in. And maybe this electron would be like, woo, I'm going to go charge a phone real quick. But then it's going to eventually come back and end up being used as glue for the silver, right? But if as it's leaving, the solution, this more positive solution right here, is getting more positive, this electron might be like, you know what, nah, I need to stick around here to balance stuff out. I'm gonna come back, and this copper is gonna come back onto here. So my point is, if the solutions develop charge, then the electrons won't flow. The electrons will be compelled to stay where they are, and your cell won't work. You won't charge your phone. You won't power your blowy clown. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like the car wash dolls that you blow air into <laughs> that go up and down. Um, there's some word for that that I'm not thinking of. But <laughs> those are powered by some sort of battery. And those electrons aren't going to flow if they are compelled to stick around and contribute to canceling the charge. So here's where the salt bridge comes in. We have some cations over here. So as these cations join onto the cathode, these can flow in here and continue to cancel out the charge with the nitrate. We've got more nitrate anions right here. Does it have to be the same anion? I'm honestly not sure, but it's certainly convenience if it is. I don't know if it has to be or not. Um, it's probably the most elegant thing to do that, but I'll have to think about that. Uh, either way though, as the copper, let me change my highlighter color. As the copper cations peel off of the solid copper into the solution and the solution gets more positive, the nitrate can come down from the salt bridge and cancel that out. So the purpose of the salt bridge, why is it necessary? Why is the salt bridge necessary? Well, part of that has to do with galvanic. Galvanic is the same thing as voltaic, which equals basically um, makes electricity to use, that you can use. The other kind of cell, if the electrons go the other way, is an electrolytic cell. And that's basically how you can charge your battery. You can charge it to become a voltaic or galvanic cell later. So the salt bridge is necessary in the galvanic cell because if you didn't have it, the electrons wouldn't go and the cell wouldn't be galvanic. Galvanic means you're making usable electricity you're creating a flow of electrons that you can connect to an external circuit to power something so if you don't have the salt bridge you end up getting charged solutions and the electrons will not move because they will stay where they are to prevent the solutions from getting charged the salt bridge essentially frees up the electrons to move from the anode to the cathode so, okay, cool. That is all the problems for today. And this is the first week that I got through all the problems. Um, I don't remember when I started, so I don't know if that was less than an hour or not, but we had far fewer problems than we've had. So that's an introduction to redox and electrochemistry. Um, as usual, the Pauling electronegativity numbers uh, fuel the concepts here. This table right here, this electronegativity of the elements table, or the Pauling electronegativity scale, this is one of the most crucial conceptual foundations in chemistry as it stands today. Now, of course, I think Pauling came up with this in the like 60s or 50s, maybe. Um, so a lot of chemistry happened before this existed, but this table explains so much chemistry when you think about it. So I definitely encourage you to just have this table in mind all the time. Um, 
not all the time, but when you're working with electrons and chemicals. And the other big thing, I just want to leave you with oil rig of electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. I started with that, I'm ending with that. If you keep oil rig in your head, then redox stuff is not that bad. And of course, if you're watching this on a computer, then tons of redox electricity stuff is happening uh, before your very eyes. So thanks for watching. I hope uh, everything's going well in your studies and uh, you'll see me in the next one. Oh, I didn't click the button. I always like to say that because people always end YouTube videos by saying like, I'll see you in the next one. It's like, no, you won't. You don't see the viewer. The viewer sees you. So uh, if you watch the next one, you'll see me in the next one. Thank you. Have a good night.